action. Why did you want to join the police force? It's always been an ambition of mine since I was a little boy. I feel I have a calling to protect and serve. Stop, police! Red, White and Blue, which stars John Boyega as Leroy Logan, is the true story of black police officer Leroy Logan, who, having been a successful research scientist at the Royal Free Hospital, decided to join the police force in 1981. I applied to combat negative attitudes. There are divisions and misunderstandings, and I think I could change that. He was a dedicated police officer, though, in fact, he suffered a great deal of racism within the force itself. Good afternoon, Good Leroy. Afternoon. It's an absolute honour to have you on the platform. You were both the founder and chair of the National Black Police Association. You were involved in it for 30 years. You Not also quite, were... Right. Almost, almost. <laughs> almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> from, from the founder member days that start... Actually, it is 30. From the found, if you take the founder member meetings before we launched, that was 1990, roughly. And uh, anyway, yeah, I think you're about right. Yeah, about 30 years. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and, and you were also a superintendent in the police force. Mm -hmm. you, you were involved in the Stephen Lawrence and Damilola Taylor inquiries. And yeah. your powerful story was captured in Steve McQueen's series. BBC Small Acts in the episode Red, White and Blue. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming on. And the first question I'd like to ask you is please tell us about your early life and growing up. Yeah, well, I, I grew up in um, Islington. I was born in the Royal Free Hospital, uh, the old site, which is in Liverpool Road, right next to Chapel Market, which is a sort of a very long-standing market in um, Islington in the south of the borough and um, all, all, all of my education was in Islington but a short period I was in Jamaica uh, for a few years in primary school and um, spent that time in Spanish town and that was like a master class in identity which was great because when I came back to finish off my primary school and then gone to Highbury Grove Secondary School um, I needed that very strong sense of who I am and what my meaning of life is all about and my heritage, which uh, made me very um, proud. So I, I suffered from a superiority complex as opposed to an inferiority complex. Um, and then I did my A-levels in Hackney, Hackney College, and then did my degree in the University of East London in the uh, Stratford branch, where um, I finished my degree in 1980, and then applied for a job at the Royal Free, which is now the new site in Hampstead, and uh, worked there for a few years before I got the calling of policing. And I joined the Met in June 1983. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history. Wow. And one thing that was particularly powerful about your journey to becoming a police officer is it came about because you saw two police officers assaulting your father. Well, I didn't actually witness it. Uh, unfortunately, I, I witnessed the impact of it, literally, uh, when I... I was at the Royal Free and I got a call from my sister and my mother that my dad was been, had been beaten up by local officers over a traffic matter. And I rushed to our local hospital at the Whittington in Islington. And there I saw, well, I actually walked past my dad because I didn't recognise him. He was literally beaten black and blue. And um, um, I, I was well, very hurt because he's my hero, my role model, and I couldn't understand why my dad in his late 50s would be subject to such a savage beating. Even though he sued them successfully for unlawful arrest and excessive force, it, it was definitely something that really hurt him because, you know, he respected police officers um, a lot and he didn't think he would warrant that because, as I said, he was in his late 50s. He wasn't your 
typical person who might be a bit aggressive or had the wrong attitude. And, um, and he was a long distance driver. So he, he was used to getting stopped by police and know how to deal with them. So yeah, it was really tough, but um, even though that happened to him, I still saw the need to, to join the police. And it was really very upsetting for my dad because he, he wanted me to stay as a scientist, possibly going to medicine. And here I was um, leaving science and joining the ranks of officers who beat him up. So he was extremely upset. But to his credit, as a very strong and wise man, he supported me in joining in June of 1983, uh, which was uh, shown in the film. Quite a touching scene as he drove me to Hendon and, you know, said goodbye to me. So it, it actually did happen without the hugs and the, the Al Green music. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my dad wasn't that way inclined to be too tough. Car. I got a handshake and told him, told him to get out of the car. <laughs> he, he was really positive. Mm. considering what had happened to him only a, a few short months earlier. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it was actually really a powerful scene in that um, episode as well, when he was driving you um, up to hand, and especially as he was your role model. I think one thing that is also particularly powerful and it also demonstrates your strength is that during the time you were a police officer, you were pretty much a lone wolf in that profession and many people viewed you as somebody that may have betrayed your community because <clears throat> at that time it wasn't really a period where um, there was lots of people you know within like the Bain community who were operating as police officers so how did you cope with that you know that feeling of maybe rejection and um, from those in your community when you were trying to serve them? I think because I was a bit older than most recruits um, most recruits Joining the police are in their sort of late teens, early 20s. I was 26. Um, I was married at that time. We had our first son. Um, actually, my, my, our first child, um, Jared, was born in week 10 of Hendon. Mm. So I, I, I was quite clear on my beliefs and values. And I, I anticipated I was going to get a hard time from the community because, you know, if you ever want to reduce your Christmas card list by 95%, join the police because my most of my friends were very anti. So I can imagine the rest of the community were going to be in worse. Uh, and I also knew I was going to get a hard time from my colleagues. So because of the way in which they operated in, in those days and they're sort of growing up in their 60s and 70s with the SUS law. So I wasn't, I was, I wasn't going in there believing all would be well. I, I was sort of um, um, battle ready, as it were, to, 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 to carry out the, the good fight, to carry out my purpose. And I knew I had to be strong in my character, strong in my faith, and making sure that I was not going to allow personalities or people's prejudices to derail me, I'd stick to the task because I, I knew that that was my calling and I, and I was going to make sure I did my best and you know, do as much time in there as possible. Because I, I said, if I could do the first two years with my probation, I can do the other 28. And fortunately, I was able to do that. But yeah, I, I realised it was, it was going to be a tough, tough call. But my best friend, Lee John, his mother, um, Jessie Stevens, who again featured in the film, she was extremely um, supportive. She was a community liaison officer in those days. Mm -hmm. And she encouraged me to say that it'd be good for you to join the police because it was not too long after the Scarman report and they were doing a, a recruiting campaign for minority um, officers from African, Caribbean and Asian communities. So I, she was saying, well, this is a good time to join, if any. I, it was actually a good time because when I went to Hendon, there was a critical mass of us of 
similar background from London, African Caribbeans, and we supported each other. I know in a lot of ways, many of us are still around, you know, with lifelong friendships, even to this very day, which is, uh, well, now 30, almost 38 years ago. And yeah, it, 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 it was good that I, I did join then and um, they, they forged some strong links, as I said, which has stood the test of time. Yeah. And throughout your career, you've had to deal with so many difficult situations, especially standing in the gap for our community. So how did your faith carry you through some of the most difficult moments in your career? Well, I, I've, to be quite honest, you only have a, you don't, you don't really have a testimony until you get tested. So I knew I was going to be tested in the early days and making it clear to myself and my colleagues and the community that I'm a black man who happens to be a cop. Because that means I then integrate with a strong sense of my beliefs and values and not allowing myself to assimilate I'm going to integrate with those values and beliefs. Whereas if I was a cop who happened to be black, there's more of a chance that I'm going to assimilate and adopt the norms and values of the culture. So I knew that if I kept strong in my identity, and as I said, I went to Jamaica and I gave me a masterclass in it, I, I could withstand acquiescing and, and stripping myself of my identity and my faith and I, I made some very clear red lines. And, and in the film, you'll remember when John stands up in the class and says, you know, I didn't join to make friends. I'm here to serve the community and make changes from within. Well, actually, I did say that. Don't ask me why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seemed a good idea at the time, but it did set the tone for how people was going to see me and, and in those days, the police culture was as fast as, the, you know, social media. It was passed on, you know, watch this one. He's a bit of a troublemaker. And mm -hmm. even, even before I went to my first division, which was isn't where I grew up, it was, uh, they already knew that I was a local guy. I, you know, I had a profession before and I was married. I, I didn't have to live in police accommodation. So there wasn't anything that f had to force me into try and ingratiate myself to anyone. I, I, as I said, I, I, I was from Jamaica, uh, I suffered a superiority complex. So being in a, my local division, knowing the terrain, the people, I knew I could just generate work based on community intelligence and relationships with the community that would put me in good stead. And I was very confident in my own ability to excel. As my dad used to say, excellence is the best deterrent. So just do your best and, and don't let anyone re reduce your aspirations or your confidence in what you can do. And my faith was that anchor as well. So that in a lot of ways I was... Um, anticipating certain things before they happened. I, I knew I was going to be on someone's target just for being black and proud and mm -hmm. not apologising for any of that. So I, I was always on my guard. And some people might say it's a bit sad way to exist, but I'm like that even now. Um, I, I, I knew I was taking myself out of my comfort zone and I had to push through and I still feel better outside my comfort zone knowing I've got to be sharper and more uh, sensitive and discerning to what needs to be done so it, it's I suppose it's how I'm wired yes um, your story is truly amazing in so many ways and Steve McQueen's episode Red, White and Blue uh, John Boyega won a Golden Globe for his portrayal of you in that episode. So how did that opportunity come about to have your story portrayed on the small screen? Well, it started as far back as 2015, where um, 
um, an ex-BBC um, journalist called Helen Bart um, contacted me. She said, um, I can't tell you who the person is, but there's a, a prominent person in the film industry is looking at developing stories um, of real life people in who come from the West Indies, as he called it. And um, it has to be around their time in London in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And so is that. So I recorded my story, not far removed from how I'm describing it now. And um, in early 2016, I got this call from Helen say, listen, um, this person who I spoke about before, they really like your story and they would like to make a film out of it. And I said, who, who's that? And he said, Steve McQueen. I said, Steve McQueen of 12 Years a Slave, Steve McQueen. <laughs> said, yeah. I said, this is not a joke, is it? She, not, she said, no, it's serious. And um, later in that sort of spring time, um, spring, summer time, I, I actually met Steve in central London. And he confirmed, yep, he liked the story and he would like to make a script out of it. But in those, in the, those early days in 2016, he, he was saying um, it, it wouldn't, they wouldn't be using my name. It was just a story. So I, I was going along with that. And um, when they finally start to write the script, which was by this time going on late 2017, 2018, and I was um, working with him and his co-scriptwriter, New Courtier Newland. And, and, and Courtier lives very nearby in East London, um, not far from me. And um, we, we worked on the script and it started to move into late 2018 and they started to do the filming. And... Um, they, they were doing the other episodes first. So by the time they're filming for Red, White and Blue, and in those days, I still didn't know the name of the, of the, um, the episode. I think that came very late on. Well, they kept it as a closely guarded secret. And um, it's only when I was on a film set, I, I not realised the name. And then I realised, hold oh, on, they've got our names here. Because I went up to the set with... Uh, my, my wife Gretel and Lee John. I said, got, they've got our names here. I said, and uh, Steve said, oh, didn't I tell you? Um, you know, <laughs> we're going to use your names. I thought, oh. Okay. I said, He's a quite mischief guy, mischievous guy. Oh, he likes to uh, keep you on, on tender hooks, as they say. So, yeah, he um, said, yep, we're going to do the, the film with your name and it should be coming out late uh, 2020 and uh, and it's at the same time I was actually writing uh, that 2016 period was a, a bit of a breakthrough for me in, in terms of the book as well because I was writing that and I was getting a bit of a block but speaking to Steve um, especially during the script writing stage he really emphasised it well, got me to emphasize more on my relationship with my father, but also um, he, he was very strong in the idea that he needed to know why, if I said I love my dad and he's my role model and a father that I loved, why would I still join the police knowing those officers had beaten him up? And that's when I, he really dug deep uh, and he said, yeah, he asked me, and I said, yeah, it's my faith. And then he said, well, why didn't you tell me that from the beginning? And that really um, mobilised my thinking, and it changed the whole emphasis of the book. So it's more of a spiritual journey as opposed to just transactional. I, did, I was involved in certain cases, and um, I was fortunate to be involved in the formation of Black Police Association and... Uh, youth charity, Void Youth, and, and all these sort of things. So I was, um, you know, I, I, I realised that it, it wasn't just a transactional journey. 
it was a spiritual journey. So Steve even helped me with the book as well, which uh, that's why I asked him to do the forward and he kindly agreed. And uh, yeah, it's the, it, the book and the film are sort of running parallel and uh, mm. You know, as long as John keeps on getting awards, <laughs> you got the, obviously you got the Golden Globe um, early in the year, and you got the Crit Critics Choice Award as well. And hopefully, God willing, uh, he should get um, what well, we hope and pray that he will get the Small Screen BAFTA in June. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and it's obviously giving the book momentum as well. So. I couldn't have made this up if I tried. You know, it's definitely divine intervention. Yeah, it isn't, it isn't anything that I had this master um, plan or, you know, a real sort of um, eureka moment. It's nothing like that. It's just, you know, uh, how that organic process just blended and ra has run in parallel ever since. Yeah. Your book, by the way, is absolutely brilliant. Both me and Michelle have been reading it. Okay, it's, thank you. It's just so powerful. So even um, just moving on to the next question about... Oh, hold on. My, my cat's making a noise. I think you can hear him. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, go about your business. <laughs> no, he's, he's the greediest cat, um, but he's very good at catching mice, so I shouldn't really upset him. <laughs> because I live near Epping Forest, so we get field mice in the, in the garden from time to time, but he normally sorts them out. Um, so I can't, you know, <laughs> you know, coiled spring, as it were. But anyway, yeah, um, you were saying before I interrupted. Uh, no, no, no problem at all. You you were involved in the Stephen Lawrence and um, Damalola Taylor inquiries, but recently the government's published a race report of that the UK is not institutionally racist. Can I ask, um, from your drawing upon your experiences, um, what do you what do you think about that report in terms of you know how the Conservatives published it um, and especially drawing upon your experiences from the police because you've been through so much throughout your career and that report is very divisive it's divided people even with our own community when it comes to talking about subjects relating to race and diversity. Mm. Well, as you know, I was one of the Black Police Association members who gave evidence at the McPherson inquiry to say that the Met Police was institutionally racist. And I'm on record for saying that I still think they are over 20 years later. And I knew this race report was really going to have a false narrative, a whitewash, because it's out of Boris Johnson's playbook. When he was London mayor, he did the same thing. You would get people who look like me and you to do his dirty work, to try and change the narrative around gangs and violence and basically to, to say that black people have a propensity to be gangsters. Um, mm. And I knew when he chose Tony Sewell to be the chair of this commission of his, that... It w again, it was going to be uh, uh, out of his playbook because Tony Sewell has always been on record that he doesn't believe in institutional racism mm -hmm. or those systemic failures. Mm -hmm. uh, he's into the bad apple s scenario. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew it was just going to be... Um, a, a report with a false narrative. And so when it came out um, not too long ago, I, it didn't surprise me. In fact, I remember tweeting on the fact that Tony Sewell was going to do a report like that. It's going to be a whitewash. You get his peerage, job done. And, and that's exactly what happened. So I wasn't in any way surprised. And that's why it, it, that they're not speaking in my, in my name or anyone else's name who's got a real understanding of the systemic failures in not only policing the wider justice system, but in health, what well, COVID has laid that bare uh, around the disp disproportionalities of black people dying from COVID because of the conditions they work in, the lack of support, PPEs, the masks, everything, you know. And um, it, it, it's not going to change anyone's mind who's really got a 
a modicum of common sense or even experience around the, these issues, especially if, if, if you've gone through an education system and you know what's it's stacked against you, and, but you still strive and, and getting a job, et cetera, a profession, you know that odds are stacked against you, but you still strive. So you can't accept something that you know is just a false narrative. And that's why there's a, that backlash. But I think it, it, it should get us to be mobilised to call it out for what it is. I know they had a debate in Parliament about it. Um, and when, you know, you've got people like David Lammy who's really slamming it for what it is. Um, I know at some stage they're going to be quoting this report, but I think if the outcry continues, and we've got to you know, um, show our intent in the ballot box. And, you know, we've got elections next month. I hope people will step up and make it known that they, 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 they'll have nothing to do with this report. And um, I, I believe we, you know, we we got to be cognizant of the fact that certain people who look like us will have their own agenda, and they and unfortunately sometimes they're going to be more of a problem than the our white counterparts. We had it in in a black police mm -hmm. association when we started. Um, some of our members became some of our worst nightmare. Um, our biggest uh, critiques are, uh, you know, they were more than happy to try and undermine us. So it, it, it's been shown historically as well, long before the BPA. So I, I, I'm, unfortunately, we have to go through this, but we can't allow people to make our lives more difficult without struggling against it and, and would it mean peaceful protest or the power of the pen or petitions or voting or whatever it may be, whatever it takes. We just have to make sure that truth will prevail and, and we'll, we'll not stop until, you know, the changes we all want to see actually arrives. We, we can't expect that. Um, we can't expect that happening because of um, the, the current government we've got at the moment. They're not going to be really doing anything to assist us. They've already tried this false commission. They're going to try all sorts of other things. But we, as long as we, we are able to show our common purpose against it, I, I think we'll, we'll get through. And even the UN came out heavily against it. And um, that for me is a good indication that we need to be, keep on the struggle. You know, as, as John Lewis said, we have to continue with the, the good trouble. Uh, and I'm a strong advocate of good trouble. Clear that an investigation has taken place um, they looked at the GPS data, they've looked at the um, camera in the vehicle, and of course, witness statements. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a question of how that accident occurred, and it needs yeah. to be investigated. Peter Blexley, um, people were outraged yesterday when they saw that these two police officers, you know, heroically putting themselves in the line of danger, getting in their cars, driving at speed in order to save lives in Streatham. There, there's understandable outrage. On the other hand, what happens if there had been evidence of not driving carefully and other people were put at risk because of the actions of these police officers? Presumably that is what is under investigation. Well, yes, there is an investigation here, but let me just give you an example. And I was one of the outraged and I firmly remain so. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, we were doing covert surveillance. I was driving a high powered car. I took a bend slightly too fast, straight onto the other side of the road and collided with a car, right? My fault. I got out. I apologised. Traffic police turned up, 
cautioned me. I was reported for driving without due care and attention. Mm. Months later, I went to court, admitted my guilt and got a fine. In fact, the magistrate didn't put any points on my license because he understood the work I was doing and he thanked me for the work I was doing. I wasn't relieved of driving duties. I wasn't suspended from any kind of right. work whatsoever. I was allowed to get on with the job of catching villains. And these officers should be allowed to carry on with their job, which is, if required, shooting terrorists dead. I totally, see, I totally agree. I'm sorry, Leroy, but why can we not apply exactly the same set of circumstances just outlined there to these two guys? Well, as I said, the investigation... Because it is one of them place. wasn't even the one involved in the crash. I agree. So there's obviously something that's definitely questionable about how the accident occurred mm -hmm. and what happened directly afterwards. Well, you're presuming I, that. You know, one of the things that I... I the, one of the words that I associate with you is t t tenacious, as in, you know, really kind of um, what you've just said, you, you really, you don't let anything deter you. Um, so you, you also use the word activist, you're an author, you know, these are all really stressful kind of positions to be in and so forth. What do you do to relax? What is your hobby? What, what, what chills you out? Uh, I'll go cycling. Uh, I have my, um, my Brompton bicycle, which is uh, quintessentially English. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I will cycle around. I used to do off-street off cycling, so I had quite hybrid bikes. But uh, as I'm getting old, I'll just stick to the, the tarmac. And, and now cycle lanes are so good, and there's so many cycle paths mm. that, that are really um, very well maintained. So it's, cycling is more of a pleasure than it used to be. And I'm not sort of competing with anyone, so I'll just pedal along at my leisure. Um, and I do a bit of tennis, um, like walking. So I walk with the family uh, and friends. I suppose um, well, it's before COVID, obviously, we'd go to the theatre and um, read and, and, and visit people and and stuff go on holidays <laughs> um but I, I suppose now um it's really just walking cycling um enjoying the grandchildren and um they, they, they definitely keep me on my toes um even this afternoon um yeah so it's never a dull moment with them and because we've got the, our bubbles um because we, we pick up from school and stuff like that uh, you know, we get a real sort of uh, immersion of the children. And uh, I suppose they're my sort of full-time hobby. And, oh, yeah, I do a bit of gardening as well, sort of pop around there. Um, yeah, it's not, you know, paint the town red, as some people might think. Mm. <laughs> my <laughs> needs are simple, really. You know? mm. I, I don't sort of, um, yeah, I, I try not to live to work, but work to live and just getting that balance right. And... Uh, yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I suppose. Lastly, it's just being on this journey with the the book and the film. It's it, it's it's like a hobby, actually. Okay. I know it's stressful writing the book, but since then, um, and doing these sort of things, I, I find that uh, quite um, in gratifying and enjoyable, and a certain amount of validation of of what I've been doing mm. over the years, and it's um, helped me to understand so many things about my life that was really meant to be and and public service is still in my DNA and I, I really st uh, do like helping people. And I've still got projects I'm running um, in my own right so that can easily be picked up on my website, LeroyLogan.com. Yeah. So, that you know, it, 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 I, I'm, I suppose, not way some people might think should be slowing down, but I, as long as I've got health and strength, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, and I suppose this Sewell report has just energised me to, to keep going even more because of the different tactics this government is willing to, to use to undermine the hard work we've, we've been pushing for so many years just to fool people with this false narrative. And as I said, it's something that Boris has done many years before when he was mayor. So I, I just think, I, you know, I, I like to be the... The irritant, the, this you know, the itch they can't scratch, you know, the pebble in the shoe. That, that 
I suppose that that would be my epitaph. I was a pebble in the shoe. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I love that. I love that. There's quite a few things there that you said that are real inspiration for me. I'm doing a leadership course and I did have a look at your um, website and I'm sort of learning the theories of leadership, sort of transformational leadership and so forth. So, um, yes, it, it's a real inspiration to, to, to have, um, to be able to look. There's a lot of literature for non but for, for white authors, there's not a lot for, or, or not a lot of inspiration for black authors. Um, so it's a real inspiration to be able to say, actually, I can draw on the real life experience of Leroy. Um, yeah, that that, that, yeah. That's what it's there for. That's why I didn't want it to be a sort of transactional management type book. Mm. Uh, I wanted that uh, people, you know, who look like me, different ages, backgrounds can relate to. And also mm-hmm. wider uh, allyship, maybe give them an understanding of what's gone through. And I think because they could see things through the film, um, it sort of uh, put it in such a clear way for, for some people. Even when people I haven't heard from in the police service for decades were calling me up saying, gosh, I didn't know it was like that. And, mm. um, and I suppose it's, that that's how people have been mobilised who through the George Floyd thing because of that mm. nine and a half minutes video it, 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 it shook people it shook me mm. you know, even as a pl- pl- even as a police officer seeing most things I, I, I was reduced to tears because of it mm. and, I, and I think sometimes you know uh, books have their, their their time but I think you know having a video it says so much and it can really get people into action, uh, which it has, and I hope it will continue. Mm-hmm. So th- these are sort of things that I, I, I believe is um, important. Just give people the chance to be in your shoes, as it were, and get a sense that they can relate to it, and it is transferable. This experiences and and identifying your character and your strengths that can work in practical terms on a daily or a frequent basis. Um, the next thing I was going to ask you about is um, over the last sort of month or two, we've had some quite high profile um, incidents um, with uh, Sarah Everard and Richard Okorigay. Um, I was wondering how how could the Met um, address the growing distrust of uh, you know of the police force now? Because I think with the Sarah Everard, yeah. that was a big shock in terms of knowing that it was a police officer that's been um, arrested. You know, has, we don't know where, where it's going to go, but obviously that's building up a, a distrust of the police force. And what do you think that the Met could do to try and build that up? again uh reconnect with the community and i'm not just talking about the black community but the public because yeah. unfortunately um the, the met has a look and feel of a pre-mcpherson organization and i don't say that lightly i'm not trying to be smart or anything i'm, I'm just really going by the whole look and feel of it mm-hmm. and and the way in which they respond to cases of um, that you really need to have a relationship with the community to, un- to be in tune with it. So, I mean, the, the Sarah Everard case, just like the two young black women who were found dead in Brent, um, where police have I'm not, I'm not connected. Now, some of it is down to um, ignoring the McPherson recommendations and having independent oversight to monitor those recommendations. We had it the first 10 years through the Stephen Lawrence Steering Group. Uh, and so from the report in 1999 to 2009, you saw real significant changes internally and externally and, and reconnected with the community. And... Um, that's been eroded since the new government in 2010 till now. 
through austerity and Brexit, and they reduce community cups in safer neighbour teams and safer schools offices. So that disconnect has in, meant that people aren't talking to police like they used to. They're not working with them on the same scale. They're not giving them information, which is on the job training to know what the community mood is and being a lot more proactive on how you serve the needs of the community. So as a result of that, you'll have like with Sarah's case, even though a police officer's been charged for her murder, as you say, we'll, we'll see what happens in court. But the way in which they police the vigil was so mm. out of touch. Mm. All right, I know with COVID regulations, but even with COVID re regulations, you know, under the Human Rights Act, you still have the right to peacefully protest. COVID has mm. not stopped that. And it can be tested in court, but I think you're just going to be sensitive to, to that. Even if certain people get hijack the meeting as long as it doesn't become violent if they become violent then you you move in but you can always if you want to follow up with regulations or any sort of uh, minor public order offenses then you can always follow them or monitor them on cctv and pick them up outside mm. that sort of outside the center of attention mm. and, and i think the long game you know how's it going to look on you know, WhatsApp or, you know, Facebook or, you know, YouTube or whatever. You know, it's, 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 it's going to be, you, you've got to play it smart. And, and, and this, you know, and the two young, young women not um, sending out officers to find out where they've been. And same thing with Richard. He actually was found not too long, for, not far from where I live. You know, and in fact, I went to the site where his body was recovered. It's so sad that. Mm. He, he walked uh, about four or five miles. It must have been at least four miles. Pitch black. There's no light in there. Um, and then he ends up, whatever time, whether it's during the night or during the day, ends up in, in that pond. You know, and it's a very um, isolated area. Mm. Well, I don't know if we'll ever find out if anyone else was involved. But mm. it, and, it, and again... The mother put it across that they, the officers did not respond at an immediate impact, especially knowing that he left without his medication, he's suffering from sick soul disease, all these sort of things. That should flag up things. And, you know, they, 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 police just seem to be so disconnected and so out of touch. And, and they're just, it's firefighting type of policing. They're just reacting from one incident to another. Uh, I, I think the government has set them up in a lot of ways around reducing numbers, all right, they're trying to build them back up, but you've got COVID on top of that. Um, and there's this right-wing shift in the culture of the police through mm -hmm. Brexit, because they've seen that in the public and the police are a reflection of the public. So you, you, it, it's really showing police at its worst, which is really sad because my last job was the 2012 Olympic Games before I retired in 2013. And we saw the, the police service at its best, you know, that mm -hmm. connected citizen focus, light touch of policing with proactivity and, and a real understanding of what they have the capacity to deal with things. Now, that I, because they lack that capacity and their expertise, because they're losing a lot of officers who have, it's a bit of a brain drain in the police. And it, it, it's the the worst I've seen it, and and the leadership are in denial that oh everything's fine, you know. <laughs> um, and I think it's because of shame, you know, because some of the responses they they do is because of shame, and you know they reject it and they and they push against it and and stuff like that. So I'm not I'm not I'm not surprised it's getting, it's getting worse, and they're doubling down and are not going to admit that things are bad. And uh, I suppose it's it, it's going to get a bit worse before it gets better. I like to think it will get better soon, sooner rather than later, rather. But, um, you know, it's it's definitely very challenging times for the police. Mm -hmm. um, and I was on Good Morning Britain yesterday morning, 
and they asked me just my one question before they had to dash off. And um, I actually quoted um, a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta called The Pirate's Penzance. Myself and Lee were part of it when we was at school. And there's a song. We, we, we're, we're not only pirates, we're the police as well. And uh, there's a song about uh, a policeman's lot is not, an ever, uh, not a happy one. And mm. I think that's so, that song is so uh, appropriate now. It's mm. not a happy one. Mm. And, I, I, and, and I was, you know, it, it saddens me to say, but I just wonder if I'd be so determined to join the police now as I was almost 40 years ago. I don't know if I was still will because the, the pain conditions, the, the morale is bad because they're mm. overworked and with a high caseload, more complex cases. And um, as I said, they've had a bit of a brain drain of experience and skills. So, yeah, um, I'm just hoping that they, they can turn the tide. But, mm. yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. But if people want to do that, it's still a fulfilling job. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's still a fulfilling job. And uh, even though it's the toughest thing I've ever done, but um, I, I truly believe it's definitely worth looking into. Seriously, if someone really wants to do that. I'm Leroy Logan. I'm the author of Closing Ranks, and I wrote the book for people to understand what it is to be a black man in London and having to go through the experiences of racism and all sorts of injustices and inequalities and how that was perpetuated when I went into the police service and more importantly getting an understanding on all sides from the public with the police so that we break down a lot of the barriers that we see between the public and the police. During the 60s and 70s with the SUS law and the fact that just by being black you could easily be arrested and put before the courts because of the colour of your skin basically. Policing was a real negative image for me and many of my friends. So when it came about after finishing university and going into science research that I was frequenting the same areas as police officers because I was working at the Royal Free, they were using our sporting facilities. I didn't realise there were police officers when I was in the gym or in the bar with them or whatever. And when I get to, got to know that there were police officers, I saw the human side of it. And then I had a recollection of when I was in Jamaica as a youngster, police officers were black and they were upstanding members of the community. So it offset a lot of my prejudices and my own sort of presumptions. And as a result of that, I thought it is uh, an occupation, but I didn't think it was for me until such time my boss um, was giving me my annual appraisal. And he said, Leroy, I just can't see you being a scientist for the next three or four decades, you know, just, just striking as someone who could be a police officer. Do I look like a racist son? That's my immediate thought. In those days, that's how I saw the police. I was able to offset that by saying, well, I know these officers from Hampstead, they've taken me on a drive round and I know what they do and it, it is a very laudable profession. But between applying and getting that date to join, my dad was beaten up by police officers and, you know, the person I love to be beaten in such an un unwarranted way and, and in a vicious way by officers. I thought, put that idea to one side, never to emerge again. My dad sued them, got some legal redress, but I thought, you know, that's not gonna be my job, fortunately. I started to see that my worst nightmare could be my biggest breakthrough. Guns and